So last week we talked quite a bit about Newton's universal law of gravitation that says that the force of gravity is equal to the universal gravitational constant times mass one times mass two over r squared. Okay? Meaning that the further away we get from the center, or the, the greater our separation distance, we'll say, okay, exponentially less attraction gravitationally. All right, the bigger the masses, linearly more gravitational attraction from that. Now, we know that gravity can act as a centripetal force. Gravity acting as a centripetal force is what makes orbits happen. Okay, it's what makes something uh, orbit, you know, a planet orbit the sun, or the moon orbit the earth, or what have you. As long as it's moving in a circle around something due to gravity, it's a satellite. Okay, so earth is a satellite of the sun, the moon is a satellite of the earth, and so on and so on. Everybody with me there so far? Okay, so the definition of a satellite is one body that orbits another. Okay, so satellites obey uniform circular motion laws. So it's not a vertical circular motion thing. Okay, even if the satellite is in what we call a polar orbit. Okay, some satellites are in polar orbits that actually orbit the Earth vertically like this. When you're that high above the ground, there's no up and down. Okay, any orbit around the Earth, vertical, horizontal, whatever, is still obeying uniform circular motion laws. There's not a change in velocity because it's going around the South Pole versus the North Pole. It's not uphill to orbit the Earth north and south as opposed to around the equator. Okay, because in actual fact, very few satellites actually orbit right around the equator. Okay? That's not really what we use them for. We use them for, you know, relaying telecommunication signals and things of that nature. Okay? So for that purpose, most of those satellites actually stay over the same point on the Earth's surface. If a satellite stays over the same point on the Earth's surface, we call it what kind of satellite? It starts with a G. Geosynchronous, yeah. Okay, a geosynchronous satellite stays over the same geographical point all the time, okay, meaning that the period of its orbit has to be how long? One day, exactly. Okay, it has to orbit and it has to take one day to go around the Earth so that it's always over exactly the same point on Earth. And that's important because back in the early days of satellites, there weren't geosynchronous satellites and it created a lot of problems for people who use the earliest forms of satellite television. We'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, all orbiting bodies, gravitational attraction between the two bodies provides the centripetal force. So essentially we're saying that for any satellite, this equals this. Okay. Gravity is providing the centripetal force. So the basis for all satellite motion is that Fc equals Fg, big Fg this time, not m times g. All right. And the fundamentals of making something orbit the Earth involve this. If something is going to orbit the Earth, then it must be going fast enough that the distance it falls because of its attraction to the thing it's orbiting is balanced by the amount that object curves away. Okay? The Earth is round. For all you flat Earth crazy people. Okay? The Earth is round. It's not flat. That's why things can orbit it. It would be impossible to orbit something flat. Okay? That just doesn't make any sense. So the Earth is round and a satellite is always falling. And if you're in orbit, you're always falling. That's why you're apparently weightless when you're in orbit around the Earth. You're not actually weightless. You're still attracted to the Earth or you'd fly away. But you're apparently weightless because you're always falling. It's like being in the vomit comet, okay, that airplane, but always on the vertical part okay, where you're weightless. So, or apparently weightless. So you're always falling. That's how you make a satellite orbit the Earth. It falls, but the Earth is round, so it curves away. So it's got to go far enough. Okay, that the distance it falls is equal to the amount the Earth curved away, so it never gets any closer. Okay, that way it can always be falling, but never actually get closer to the Earth. Everybody with me on that? This was Newton's idea. Okay? Now, obviously Newton was way before rockets and satellites and things like that. So, he proved it by way of what he called a thought experiment. Newton got to the point where he didn't even have to do real science anymore. Okay, everybody just said, well, you're Newton, you're the smartest guy around, whatever you say goes. So he started saying, I say this, and it goes. 
right? So he devised this thought experiment. He said, if I carry a cannon to the top of a very tall mountain and I fire it, I can make the cannonball orbit the earth, provided it goes fast enough. And everybody went, well, you're Newton, okay. okay. It would be bad to get to that point where no one, where you actually didn't have to prove anything anymore. Okay. Uh, so what he said is, if I can make it go fast enough, the distance it will fall in the first second, 4.9 meters, okay, would be equal to the amount the Earth curves away, so it would keep falling and eventually come all the way back, at which point you'd probably want to get off the mountain because the cannonball would come back around and get you. Okay, so we wouldn't want to do that. Okay, obviously, running an experiment like this is impractical. Cannons and cannonballs are very heavy, and nobody wants to lug one to the top of a very tall mountain. Okay, but in theory, this would work. As long as it didn't hit anything along the way, okay, this would work. Other problems. Making something travel eight kilometers per second, and that's how fast it would have to travel near the Earth's surface, through the atmosphere is impossible. Okay, what will happen to it if it's going that fast? Well, it won't slow, if I could make it go that fast, what happens to most things that are going really fast that hit the Earth's atmosphere? They just burn up, okay? That's what would happen to this. Okay? It would just burn up. Okay, due to air resistance, the amount of friction that would be there okay, at eight kilometers per second would be unbelievable. Right? That's, that's what it's like to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere from orbit. That's why the space shuttles and whatever else have to have big heat shields on them. Okay? Without that, they would simply burn up. Okay, our fastest aircraft that we have, okay, like the, um, the SR-71 Blackbird, okay, the surveillance plane can go like three times or almost more than that, the speed of sound. Okay, when it lands, the pilot can't get out. They have to they have to wait for the plane to cool off okay, before he can get out. It's that hot, okay, when they're done flying it because they go so fast. Okay, through the Earth's atmosphere, it makes that much heat. Okay. All right. Uh, so this was Newton's thought experiment, and it works, okay, provided you go fast enough. Now, the whole reason that we had trouble making something orbit the Earth in the early days of the space race was we can't make it go this fast through the Earth's atmosphere, so we need to get it above the Earth's atmosphere where there's no air resistance, okay? And so that was the challenge, building a rocket powerful enough to get something that high and also going that fast, okay? All right, everyone follow the idea here? Okay. So the surface of the Earth is curved. If the ball or whatever it is that you're, we're shooting, okay, goes fast enough, okay, then after one second, it'll reach a point where the Earth has curved 4.9 meters away from it, okay, and thus it'll keep falling. So the diagram here is showing this guy hitting apples with a bat that makes no sense whatsoever, but yeah, let's say that's what he's doing, okay? If he doesn't hit them fast enough, okay, then they fall to Earth. If he doesn't hit them fast enough, they fall to Earth, okay? So these are three that would not have had sufficient velocity to make that work, okay? This one, however, is always falling, but because it's going so fast, it never comes back, okay? What if you go faster than is necessary? Yeah, you'll shoot off. It's what we call escape velocity. Anytime we wanna uh, send a spacecraft to another place in the solar system, we have to make it go faster than is necessary to orbit the Earth, and that's called escape velocity. That would result in a trajectory that would look like this, okay? And it just wouldn't re-encounter the Earth, right? It's also what we use in the gravity slingshot. We achieve a partial orbit, Okay, around something in order to make it go faster, and then we go off at an angle, okay, um, at a higher than higher velocity than needed. Okay, so a satellite in orbit, okay, always is always the same height above the Earth, and it moves with circular motion. Okay, so its centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. We're not, probably not going to use that very much. Okay, um, so what we devise here is this: centripetal force, F C is equal to Newton's universal law of gravitation. Big G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the satellite over R squared. Now, where is R measured from? Is it measured from the surface of the Earth or the center of the Earth? Center, okay? This is the one place where these questions can try to trick you, okay? A lot of times a question will say, a satellite is at an altitude of this many meters. Where's altitude measured from? the surface, okay? So to get the true radius, you have to take the altitude and add the radius of the Earth, okay, to it. So you always have to be looking for a couple of key words, altitude, height, above the surface, okay? Those kind of terms mean, oh yeah, I've got I've to either add the radius on or 
If the question asks how far above the Earth's surface is it, then you would calculate the radius and then subtract the Earth's radius from that to get the altitude from there. Okay, so that's one of the little tricks that can be played on you okay, if you are uh, solving a satellite motion question. So we're looking at okay, the different kinds of orbits here. Okay, we have um, like these different launch points. Okay, a circular orbit would obviously be a circle. Okay, uh, we could have a bound orbit. Bound orbits are different. Okay, their speed changes throughout the orbit. Uh, we use those sometimes for surveillance satellites. Okay? Um, we use them for many of our spacecraft that are in orbit around other planets, okay? especially the gas giants. We don't want them close to the gas giants all the time because there's a lot of radiation stuff that comes off. It's bad for them. So they kind of zoom in real quick, take lots of pictures, and then fly out on this wide part of their orbit that takes them away. Okay? Um, but we don't use it around Earth very much other than for surveillance satellites. And then we have our escape orbit, okay, or escape velocities. If we go faster than is necessary, okay, then you'll fly off uh, at a tangent to the Earth. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay, one thing that can come into play here with the formula. Sometimes you will get a question that will ask you to calculate the radius of an orbit and it'll give you a period instead of speed. What are you going to have to do in a situation like that? So we'll say it gives you, let's say we'll know the mass of the satellite, we'll know the mass of the body being orbited, okay? And we're given period and we're asked to find radius. So if I have only those givens, I can't use the formula the way it's written here. So we have to do that thing I talked about earlier on in the unit. You guys remember what I'm talking about? Substitution, okay? I have to substitute in for V this formula, okay? Because I don't have V. And because I don't have R, I have no way to calculate it either. Everyone follow me on that? Okay, so I've got to substitute this formula in for V, which means first, what do I have to do to this formula? Square it, okay. So that's gonna mean it's four pi squared r squared over t squared. So I'm gonna plug that in for v. All right, so I plug that in. I have an r on the bottom and an r on the top. So the r on the bottom will cancel. The r on the top will no longer be squared. So I've substituted in, okay, that's all you have to do takes a little practice, but it's not overly difficult. Now I would manipulate and solve for R. Okay, so I wanna get all the R's on the same side because I've got an R squared over here and I got an R over here. So first thing I'm gonna do is bring the R squared over here. What's R squared times R? R cubed, right. Okay, so now I've got R cubed, that R is gone. Now I'm gonna move everything else over to this side. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by T squared. Okay, so T squared is gone. And then I'm going to divide both sides by m2, 4 pi squared. Okay, what happens to the m2? It cancels, all right? And that's the mass of the satellite, remember? Okay, the mass of the satellite always cancels. So m2 is gone, the 4 pi squared is gone, and I'm left with r cubed equals this. So if I want to get just r, what do I have to do to this? Cube root it. Okay, on your calculator, to take a cube root, okay, will involve you uh, going um, math. Oh, sorry, it has to be on for that to work. Okay, hit math, and it'll be number four. If you hit four, it'll take a cube root. If you need to cube something, it's hit three, and it'll put a cube on there instead of a square. All right, so you have to use that math function on your calculator from time to time when we're doing this. Okay, so that's going to come into play fairly often when you're doing a satellite motion problem, because very often we don't know how fast a planet is moving in its orbit, but we know how long it takes for it to make its orbit. Okay, so those are, period is something we're gonna use a lot more often than speed when we're talking about satellite motion. Okay, so if we wanna find the period, okay, of a satellite's orbit, okay, we find the force of gravity is balanced by centripetal force, so that's what I just went over here, okay, or similar to that, except I solved for R, okay, this would be solving for T instead, okay. Um, 
Okay, and then remember guys, orbital velocity and orbital period are independent of the mass of the satellite. That means the mass of the satellite is always going to cancel, okay? Because all things fall at the same rate regardless of their mass and the satellite is always falling, okay? Um, second thing, velocity and period equations uh, derived can be used for any body orbiting another. So this formula that we were just looking at, okay? This whole um, m4 pi squared r over t squared equals g m1 m2 over r squared that can be used for any body that orbits another so it can be a planet around the sun it can be a moon around another planet it can be uh anything it can be our star orbiting the center of the galaxy even okay, as long as it's one thing orbiting something else that formula will apply okay all we have to do is determine the mass of the central body okay because the mass of the satellite doesn't matter all right so we'll do a couple of examples here, guys, and see how we do. So um, we've done this one here. Actually, we've done the moon one already, so we'll skip that one. Let's look at Neptune here. So we'll do number one together on this. So for number one here, we have Neptune's average orbital radius is 4.50 times 10 to the 12 meters from the sun. They give you an orbital radius. That's center of Neptune to center of the sun. So those are already center to center. Okay, so we know that R is 4.50 times 10 to the 12 meters, okay? Uh, the mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30. All right, so that'll be mass one, okay? Uh, we're looking for Neptune's orbital speed. They didn't give me the, the mass of Neptune. Why not? It cancels, it doesn't matter anyway. All right, so we're looking for Neptune's orbital speed. So we got mv squared over r, okay? Centripetal force equals Newton's universal law of gravitation. We're solving for V. So I'm going to multiply both sides by R. And when I do that, this R will disappear and the squared will go away. And then I'm going to divide both sides by the mass of Neptune. Okay, so that mass and mass 2 will go away. And then I'm just going to square root it all to get V. All right, so V will equal the square root of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of the sun, 1.99, times 10 to the 30, okay? And then we divide that by R, which was 4.50 times 10 to the 12. All right, so it's messy to put in your calculator, that's for sure, because there's lots of brackets. All right, so Neptune is moving at 5.43 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. So that's exactly what they get there. Okay. All right, I want you guys to try number two. See how you do on number two there. All right, so for question number two, okay, we have the moon Miranda orbiting Uranus at a speed of 6.68 times 10 to the 3 meters per second, okay? So we want to use that and the speed of Uranus, which is 8.68 times 10 to the 25, to determine the radius of its orbit. All right, so we have mv squared over r, the centripetal force, equals the force of gravity. And this time we're trying to find r. All right, r is on the bottom in both of these equations. So since r squared is the r that won't cancel, I'm going to go and bring it up here, okay? And that'll cancel off this r as well as the squared. So I'm multiplying both sides by r squared and then canceling the squared off with this r here. Then I'm going to bring uh, the v squared and the m over to this side, okay? So just so it doesn't get too messy, all right? That's going to mean that the mass of Miranda will cancel, which is good because we weren't told what it was, okay? And then v squared will end up over here, all right? So R is gonna equal big G times the mass of Uranus over V squared. Everybody all right with that? So R will equal 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times uh, 8.68 times 10 to the 25 divided by uh, 6.68 
times 10 to the 3 squared. All right, and when we do that, we should get 1.30 times 10 to the 8 meters, and that is from the center of Uranus. Uranus is, by the way, how you pronounce it. It is not Uranus, because I know that's how lots of people pronounce it. It is not pronounced that way. Okay. All right. Interesting trivia fact. Sorry. Can I go over the manipulation again? Yes. Okay. So I started out with mv squared over r, and this was the mass of, the, of Miranda. Okay. And then I have big G times the mass of Uranus times the mass of Miranda over r squared. So what I did is I multiplied both sides by r squared first. Okay. So that canceled. That went away. This is gone. With me there. Then I'm going to divide both sides by mv squared because I want r over here by itself. So I brought the mass of Miranda and v squared over to here. So that canceled, that canceled. I was left with big G times m over v squared. Yeah? All right. So interesting trivia fact. Weird name for a moon, right, Miranda? All of Uranus's moons are named after Shakespearean characters. All of them. There is actually a naming scheme for every planet's moons in the solar system. Okay, Earth is called Luna because when you only have one one moon, it's easy. You just call it the moon. Okay, but if you have more than one, it becomes a little more difficult. You can't call them all the moon because then they don't all have different names. Okay, so Mars has how many moons? Two. Okay, now Mars is the god of what? War. Okay, the companions of war are fear and panic. Phobos, fear, demos, panic. Okay, so it's named, anything that orbits Mars would be named with some sort of companion of war theme. Okay, Jupiter, biggest planet, named after which god? J Jupiter, yeah, Zeus. Okay, now, Zeus was morally bankrupt, we'll say. Okay, um, he had many women. Yeah, he was not very nice. Um, so Jupiter has over 60 moons. And we haven't run out of names of Zeus's lovers yet. Yeah, that's Greek mythology for you. Okay, a little weird. Okay, so the, all, of the, all of the moons of Jupiter are named after the lovers of Zeus. Okay, Saturn. Okay. Saturn's moons are all named after Titans. Okay, so all of the moons of Saturn are named after Titans. Okay, um, we talked about Uranus already. Neptune's moons are all aquatic themed. Okay, like Triton and, and things like that. So they're all aquatically themed. Um, for Pluto, what's Pluto the god of? Pluto is the god of the underworld. So all of the moons of Pluto have to do with underworld themes. Its biggest moon, Charon. Charon is the name of the boatman who carries you across the river Styx. Okay? Charon. Charon. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's C-H-A-O-R-N. Some people pronounce it Charon, some Charon. doesn't matter. It's the name of the boatman who takes you. You have to pay him. Right? That's why in uh, old like kind of Greek mythology, they would put coins on the pe dead people's eyes. That was to pay the fair across the river sticks into the, the netherworld. Okay, so that's all of that. So there's all there's people actually spent time coming up with these themes okay, for, for naming. So if you discover a new moon around the planet, you don't just go, I'm going to name it after me. No, you're not. Okay, you have to go by a certain naming scheme, okay, which kind of takes all the fun out of it. But there you go. There is a useless piece of trivia for you. Okay. Uh, Okay, let's have a look at this one, because this one's going to involve us doing a little bit of substitution. So we have Landsat, which is an imaging satellite that takes pictures of the ozone layer. Okay, the holes in the ozone layer are around the poles, so Landsat goes in a polar orbit. Okay, that is almost like a vertical orbit. Okay, um, so it orbits the Earth at a height of 912 kilometers. Where is height measured from? From the surface. So what do we have to do with that number right off the bat? Add the radius of the Earth's surface and convert it to meters. Okay, so to get the true radius we're dealing with here, we're going to take 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. We're going to add on to that um, 912,000 meters. 
okay, to get the true radius of the Earth. All right, so the true radius of this thing's orbit is 7.282 times 10 to the 6. All right, other givens. It's orbiting what? Earth. Okay, so one of the masses involved here is the mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24 meters. All right, it wants us to find its orbital speed and its orbital period. So we'll find period first, because that involves doing that substitution we talked about a few minutes ago. Okay, so I have mv squared over r equals big G times mass of the Earth times mass over r squared. Okay, I don't have v, and I want to substitute in to get t. All right, so I'm going to take v equals 2 pi r over t, and I'm going to square it and put it in here. So that's going to be 4 pi squared r over t squared. Okay, so now I can solve for period. So I'm going to bring the r over here. So r squared times r is r cubed. I'm going to bring t squared over here to put it on top so I can solve for it. And then I'm going to divide both sides by g times the two masses. Okay, the mass of the satellite will cancel, right? And then I'm going to square root in order to get t. All right, so it's a lot of a lot of manipulating, but it's you know, nothing you guys can't handle. All right, so I have four pi squared times um, 7.282 times 10 to the 6 cubed divided by 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24, all right? So lots of numbers to put in here in order to get T. Okay, I think I have enough brackets. I think this is where you get this is where it gets really airy. Okay. Show the manipulation again. Yeah. All right. So the period of the orbit of Landsat is six point one eight times ten to the three seconds, which is like a little about an hour and forty minutes, okay. something like that. Okay. All right, so we want to see the manipulation again, yes? Okay. Okay, so the first thing we did is we squared this to plug it into the um, to the mv squared over r. So we had m is 4 pi squared times r squared over t squared times r. And then we said big G times the mass of the earth times the mass of the satellite over r squared. So the first thing we did was cancel off this r and the squared here. Okay, and that's essentially our starting point because there would have been an r squared on the top and an r on the bottom. With me, Katie? Yeah, okay. So I'm trying to get t squared by itself. I don't want to solve for something on the bottom of the equation, so I'm going to multiply both sides by t squared. So it ends up over here on the top and it cancels here. Then I'm going to multiply both sides by r squared. So r squared times r is r cubed. So now that one is gone. Okay. Then I need to get t squared by itself. So I brought big G, mass of the Earth, and the mass of the satellite over to this side by dividing both sides by them. Okay. That meant the mass of the satellite canceled 
off. And then I took the square root. So now I'm solving for t. Okay, so yeah, the manipulation's a little bit involved for sure, okay. um, but nothing you guys can't handle. Questions on how that one works? Okay, the other part of this was they wanted to know what v was, right? Which I would say uh, now that I have t, I could just do this and solve for v rather than set up mv squared over r equals all that stuff again. There's no point in doing that. I can solve for v with this because I have all the other numbers. Okay, so I would just go v equals uh, 2 times pi times 7.282 times 10 to the 6, okay, divided by uh, 6.18 times 10 to the 3, okay, and I would have the speed of Landsat. So that would be... All right, so we'd be moving at, um, seems a little big. But that's what it is. Okay, um, so there we go. Questions on that one? Okay. All right. Try these two here, okay? They're very much like the one we just did, okay? Just remember, watch out for that trick with altitude, orbital height, okay? Stuff like that, okay? Remember that you may need to add or subtract the Earth's radius, okay, in those situations. Okay, so the International Space Station, we're told, has an orbital height of 359.2 kilometers, which means I need to add on to that the radius of the earth, okay? Because this always has to be from center to center, all right? So the true radius here is going to be 359,200 meters plus 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters, okay? In order to give us that true radius. Okay, so 359200 plus 6.37 6. All right, so there's our actual true radius, 67292. All right, so now we have our true radius. We're looking for its orbital speed, okay? So we got FC equals FG, as with all satellites. And that means MV squared over R equals big G times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the International Space Station divided by the orbital radius, okay? So I'm looking for V, so I'm gonna multiply both sides by R, and when I do that, that's gonna cancel off the squared here. The mass of the International Space Station is also going to cancel, and then I'm gonna take the square root. So I'm gonna have V equals the square root of big G times the mass of the Earth orbit over the orbital radius. And then I can plug in my numbers from there. All right, so V will equal uh, the square root of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.98 times 10 to the 24 divided by 6.7292 times 10 to the 6. Okay. Um, now, you are going to get a slightly different answer most likely than they have because the numbers on our formula sheet are different than the numbers in the textbook. Okay, that is the mass of the earth is different in the text and the, the radius of the earth is also different in the text where this comes from. Okay, so when we do that, we're going to get All right, so the orbital speed of the International Space Station is 
or 7.70 for us, okay, uh, the way that rounds out, uh, 7.70 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. Okay, obviously that's a lot faster than the moon. We calculated the moon's velocity in orbit and it was 1.0 times 10 to the 3. Why is the moon so much slower than the International Space Station? They both orbit the Earth. Why would one be so much slower? Yeah, that, no, why does the moon take a month is what I'm asking. It's farther away, exactly. It's not that it's heavier, okay? Mass doesn't matter here. Mass with moon would cancel anyway, okay? The difference is it's that much further away. So the force of gravity pulling on it is less, so it doesn't have to move as fast. Okay, that's the thing we got to remember there. All right, how many people are done number two? Okay, do we need to go over that one as well? Yes? Okay. All right, so for this X-ray satellite, okay, we're taking pictures of high energy objects in the universe. It is orbiting at an altitude of 114,593 kilometers. That's got to be added to the radius of the Earth, and we're looking for its orbital period. Okay, so again, first thing we want to do is calculate what the actual radius is. So we're going to take that uh, 114,593 um, we have to put three zeros on that because it's in kilometers plus the radius of the Earth, 6.37 E6. All right, it's a long way away, okay? And an X-ray satellite does have to be a long way away so that the magnetic field of the Earth and other things like that don't interfere with it. Okay, so now we've got the radius there. So um, we'll write that down, 1.2096. And I didn't see how many decimals that was. Okay, so there's our orbital radius. We're looking for the orbital period. So we're going to have uh, FC equals FG, but we're going to plug in, we're going to substitute in, okay, um, in order to get T here. So instead of having V, we're going to do that 4 pi squared times R over t squared thing, okay, equals big G times the mass of the Earth, mass of the satellite over R squared. Okay, so looking for period, going to multiply both sides by t squared, multiply both sides by R squared, okay, and then divide both sides by G and the two masses, so we'll be left with this, 4 pi squared times R cubed over G times the mass of the Earth square rooted, equals t. All right, that'll be our manipulation for that one. Okay, and we'll have times our 1.20. I'm not going to write all the decimals here, but I'll put them all in the calculator. Times 10 to the 8. That has to be cubed, okay, divided by 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Uh, times the mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24. That will give us big T. And so, Okay, so that's the top, okay, of the equation. Now we're going to divide that by what's on the bottom here, 6.67 E negative 11, and then the mass of the Earth. And then we're going to square root that. Okay, so it takes a long time, 4.19 times 10 to the 5 seconds. It's also a long way away. Okay, so it's going to take quite a bit longer uh, for it to go around. Okay. Everybody all right with that one? So again, lots of manipulating, and you have to watch out for the one dirty trick they can play on you, altitude, height, above the surface, okay, that kind of stuff. All right, so there's a couple of satellite motion problems on the uh, in the worksheet booklet that I'm going to have you guys work on here for a bit, and then tomorrow we'll probably talk about gravitational fields. We'll have 
And then Wednesday, we might even be looking at unit exam review by Wednesday. Okay, it'll either be Wednesday or Thursday that we're doing that, depending on how the rest of this goes.